Two things are going around, which is the hard copy of the plant list I'm going to talk about in here, and that's in the back of the room, and that should, it's in a green binder, um, and that will good, and that's coming forward. And I'll think, uh, two other things I've done, which not, I'm not going to talk about here, but I've also done for docents. These are two small booklets I made for, uh, in one case, uh, the perfume and cosmetic herbs in the Huntington Herb Garden, and the other is the dye and fiber plants, and just recently in the Huntington Herb Garden. And these are uh, really developed to give docents talking points about the plants. There's nothing original in here, I hope. And so these are, <laughs> all right, so these are uh, the talking points and their reference to Wikipedia or whatever sense. So, um, you know, it's, I'm, not, I'm not liable for that. But anyhow, um, I was just talking to Dave about this. How I got into this project with Tech Info is that I live in Los Angeles and I volunteer at the Huntington uh, Gardens, the Huntington Library. And probably many of you have been there or know of the Huntington Library. It uh, was purchased by Henry Huntington. Do you know who Henry Huntington was? Uh, okay, you know. So he was, anyhow, he purchased it in uh, 1903. At the time, there were about 500 acres. There's about 200 acres left. The city of San Marino was carved out of the ranch. Uh, there's about 120 acres that are the botanical gardens and the active garden at the Huntington. Um, there are... Um, so oh, the herb gardens weren't really one of the smaller ones. But uh, Tech Info got there because uh, I had volunteered just as a normal garden volunteer in the herb garden for a number of years. And there had been a change in management of the garden. Uh, and a new gardener came in, and she was energetic and wanted to do not only different planting and a mix of plants, but she also wanted to document it differently. So she decided to use the tools at hand. Those tool, that tool happened to be PowerPoint. <laughs> All right, so she's doing drawings and trying to make a list of plants in PowerPoint to uh, nearly unending frustration. And we looked at it and we said, this is better than we've had because we really didn't have much before. There have always been plant lists. The most recent was done in a word processor. There have never really been drawings. Uh, and I have to tell you, this plant list uh, evolves with a garden. The, 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 uh, something is wrong here. It disappears. All right, good. Um, the plant list evolves with the garden. And at one time, 20 years ago, uh, it was largely a fixed planting design. And when a plant died, it was taken out. And when they finally got a, another plant of the same type, they put it back where the other plant died. Well, that's not today. But today, what's happened is she's redesigning the garden. And plants are moving around. They're changing more often. And they're re being repurposed. And she's experimenting with the beds. So a plant list is really important today because the garden changes all the time and nobody can find anything if you go in there. <laughs> so so that's, why, uh, that's why we think it's important. So let's go to the next slide. Um, I, after struggling with PowerPoint, I said to her, you know, let me try something. I think there's a better way to do this. And I wanted to use Tech Info because I thought uh, I would need a number of formats, HTML and a PDF. I don't think anyone at the Huntington is interested in info as a file format. But anyhow, uh, but HTML was one hope, and I could do this from a single source. All right, what I discovered was the Huntington is not going to host a website for volunteers to upload files. They will upload PDFs, but it's on their server, and their staff touches that server. So volunteers don't touch it. PDFs are fine. They, they look nice. Uh, but that one is some version of it is sitting on the Huntington volunteer website. And what I do is produce the list with information from the gardener. So this is really not my list. It's the gardener's list of plants. Uh, I tell her I do the formatting and I do the fluffing. But I, you know, this is, she really owns the data in here. All right. And it goes out, put together as a PDF, and I email it to 60 people. Uh, in, in an email message. So that's how they get it. They can look at it, and I encourage them to look at it at home on their machines. There's a printed copy in the garden. It's identical to the one that's coming around. Uh, and many of them have put it on a tablet or their cell phone and walk around the garden, and they can look at a plant and find the plant. So the trick is uh, I walked into... Uh, hmm, oh, I need to be in presentation mode now. Um, Hmm. Go back to view. 
I'm sorry? Off of the view menu. I'm not getting a response. Control L. Yeah, what am I doing here? Control L. No. Menus. Yeah, full screen presentation. <laughs> okay, there we go. We're back in a presentation. Okay, so um, there's the outline, a little bit about the Huntington, uh, who uses it, the certain requirements. Uh, the herb garden was originally done for Huntington's wife, Arabella. It was done about 1920 or so. And it was actually a cutting garden for her interest in, in plants. It wasn't herbs at all. And uh, she died in 19, I think, 24. And the garden went through many things. Finally, a secretary, William Hertrick, who had originally designed the garden, he was from Germany, a German trained horticulturalist. And it was a Renaissance, Italian Renaissance design garden, and you'll see that. Uh, a secretary of his said, I've just sold my house in San Marino. I have this herb collection. I'd like to you know, place it to Huntington where I could put these things back in the ground. I said, sure, there's this little garden out here. And that's what she did. And by 1970, there was an interest in an herb garden again, and then it was completely redesigned as an herb garden in 1980. And it'll probably be redesigned in the next five years physically, a physical design, but probably will stay as, a, as an herb garden. All right, so uh, at the Huntington, a little bit about the Huntington first. And that's out of her instant messages oh, yeah. oh, okay. when it comes up. Okay. So Since we don't know how to turn it off. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, this little gremlins here. But anyhow, uh, there's a library, art gallery, and botanical gardens. Um, the crown jewel of the Huntington is its library. There's no question about it. And, you know, 1,700 to 2,000 scholars come a year to use the library. Uh, 120 acres for the gardens, around 300, 350 employees now. There are over 1,000 volunteers. Um, a quarter to a half acre. It's one of the smaller gardens designed by Hertrick, established in the 1970s. And there's always been plant lists in some form for the herb garden. And who uses this list? Well, the curator and the gardener use it for growing or documenting what's there. Uh, docents use it, about 60 them, for learning the garden, informing visitors. And we have maybe 50,000 visitors a year to the herb garden. So many people come in, and they may ask, what plant is that? And so we whip out the plant list and tell them. And then they'll say, how is it used? And if we know, we tell them. And if we don't know, um, we tell them. <laughs> <laughs> or we look it up, and I'll show you how you can look that up. And uh, then the next question is, well, how do I get to the Chinese garden or the Japanese garden? And where are the restrooms? And thank you, but I'm just waiting for my reservation for uh, the tea room, which is where the herb garden is. So that's it. So the guidelines we had between the gardener and I was there around 400. It's been up to 450 plants. Uh, she, uh, we had information about each plant through a couple of web links. That conversation started with, Joe, would you mind writing a couple of sentences about each plant? And I said, no, I won't do that. And so, <laughs> so uh, but I will give you links to a website. And those folks know more than I do, and they maintain it. They keep it up. So let's, let's talk about, I mean, she's very conscious. She probably takes care of 800 plants in this garden. So she's very conscious about maintenance effort. Uh, so that's where that ended. Uh, there are 25 beds. Uh, we needed to place each plant with a marker in that bed. Uh, we need to summarize it. That was my idea. After we had these things there, I wanted to add an index. We did. And I wanted to show taxonomic relationships in the garden. And we did that. And all these last three things are done by scripts. So this project, besides uh, Tech Info and um, Inkscape, which I use for the diagrams, has become uh, a largely the effort has been devoted to, to shell scripts to help manage this project. And, I, and I'll talk about that a little bit. So the plant list should be online, and it is, and it's in print. All right, give you an idea. Here's a shot across the garden, and that's a representation, that's a reproduction of an 18th century German wellhead. And the building in the background is the tea room where everybody has a reservation. But, and they walk through the herb garden. So the question is, how much do they spend there? It's a destination garden for some people really interested in herbs. They'll spend 45 minutes or a half hour. For most people, it's 10 or 15 minutes. 
and they'll go on or they might walk around. So um, that's uh, kind of the user demand for that. Here's uh, one of the beds, it's a cut flower bed, uh, remembering Arabella because it's, that's what it was originally designed to do. Um, and these are the, some of the herb garden stalwarts. Let me get rid of this other stalwart, which keeps coming back. Uh, ghost here. And uh, the gardener is on the left. So Kelly Fernandez, the, the uh, couple in the middle, uh, did the administration for the garden for about eight years themselves. And, uh, and the woman on the right now does the scheduling. So um, we're going to do some other training in the fall. And part of the module, which I'm going to write, is about how do you manage a group of volunteers to run a docent program in a garden. And uh, there's actually quite a bit to it. But one of the biggest things is succession planning for positions. And probably the happy, I, I did a lot of the things, scheduling and other things. And probably the things I'm most proud of is getting rid of the job and giving it, finding other people to take it over. And so the question is, that really is a critical, at this age group, retirees for the most part, um, that want to take a vacation, that might get sick, uh, so they need backup and they need a plan of who's coming next so, and a training program to do it. So that's the way we've done it. When I've gone to somebody and say, would you please take this over or would you consider taking this over, they'll say, I don't want to do this by myself. And the answer is, you're not going to be alone. We'll back you up. And after they get comfortable with the job, they never ask for backup, <laughs> which is a good thing because they want to do it their own way, and that's fine. Debbie Soiki is doing a much better job I, I did in scheduling, uh, but I can, I'm there. I mean, I can back her up in a moment. And that's true with almost every other job, uh, that volunteer job in here. So uh, we're also very cautious or very clear about what is a Huntington staff responsibility and authority and what is a volunteer staff uh, authority too. And we have to be careful about that. And she is too. So, all right. So those are the stalwarts. And here's the map of the garden. So this is an Italian Renaissance design. You saw the wellhead in the center. Um, the stalwarts were photographed. They were standing about here and photographed this way. Uh, remember Al uh, Arabella was shooting down here into this bed. Uh, the shot across to the tea room was probably taken from here. So that gives you an orientation. The other thing is you would never know how large this garden was or what, what direction it was. So there's always an indication in every bed where north is. All right? And the other thing is there's always a scale where you see the 110 feet in there on the side. <clears throat> in this garden, none of the lines up there on these beds are parallel. None of the angles are 45 degrees. They are in my abstraction here. But this is uh, a design from... Before 1920, uh, this is an Italian Renaissance design, so I always claim that these are Renaissance dimensions here. So, <laughs> but anyhow, but it gives you a sense of scale, uh, and I'll show you how else we've done things where you can lo locate things. There are no indications on a bed of markers that you could tie to a map that you would say, okay, this is three feet in, two feet down, or something. It's all done by uh, uh, we eyeball it, the whole thing. There are markers in the bed, and we talk about the center of this bed is where the, uh, the uh, lemon grass is growing, or the baldo tree, and just it's uh, three feet from there, and that sort of thing. So, but that's how it goes. So that's the garden map. You'll see that in the printed version. Uh, and this is one of the beds. This is, a, this is this particular bed, and I made it short so you can see all the code here. But it's this bed right here. You can see, frankly, all the, the various uses of the herbs here. It's human cosmetic, and that's what the one book that goes, that's going around is about. The other was dying fiber, and that was done for June 21st. Uh, it's about, there's an experimental bed. That used to be called potpourri. She's changed the bed. Lavender used to be called uh, Tussie Bussy. Uh, and so things are changing, but we have a culinary salad and so forth, and medicinal up here. Uh, a Chase Street Lane, Butterfly Lane, and so forth. And there's a very large rose garden over here at the Huntington. And we have Julia Child's roses, one growing here and there. Uh, and that, just as an aside, that was invented by the curator of the rose garden. It takes about 10 years to invent a rose. Okay, and I said to Tom, a yellow rose, very healthy, nice bloom. It has another name in Europe. So I said to him, is that the target rose you were after when you were bringing this? He said, no. He said, I was looking for a climbing rose. But Mother Nature gave me this, and it's 
really a success. So you know, you go with you go with what you have here. Okay, so. Um, So that's the liquor bed, liqueur bed here, and the reason this is what it looks like in the printed thing and in the plantlet. So this came right out of the plantlet. 16 feet. Its companion bed, I think, on the other side, symmetrically, is about 17 feet or 18 feet. But uh, and you know where North is. So, but there's only three plants growing in here right now. She's changing the bed. Uh, you have um, first of all, and this is important. You have the common name. The botanical name, the family name, and two wetlands. And I'll show you that when we actually do the practice. And they're all on the same line. And what's important about that is uh, counting plants in this garden is equivalent to counting lines. Okay? <laughs> so when you, when you run the scripts. So that's the that's the happy thing there, and that's and that's why we left it that way. So but there's hops in here, uh, clary sage, and that so that's the diagram. And you may ask. But you haven't. Why are these things uh, labeled with the mint family and so forth? And I'll show you why when we get to the plant summary. There are, um, well, I'll tell you why now. There are about 394 plants on this plant list right now. And it's not done for the season. We're going to do more. But uh, about 333 are distinct plants. What I mean by that is that plant, 30, 333, occur. Uh, as a distinct plant, there are no other copies in the herb garden. So, for example, in the culinary bed, there are two bay laurel trees. In the dye and fiber bed, there are two bay laurel trees. All right, we only count them once in each bed because they appear once on our list, but they may appear, the number on that list may appear twice in the bed because there's a couple copies. But on each list, it should be unique. And across the garden, we only count it once. So that's what I mean by a distinct plant. There are 333 distinct plants in the garden. 209 of those plants, there are 59 plant families represented in this garden. Surprise, surprise. I mean, I was shocked when I found it was that high. But 209 of these plants fall into five families. And the mints account for 98 distinct plants out of the 300. It's huge. Uh, sunflowers, roses, uh, gardenias. And this season, because she's planted lots of peppers, it's the nightshade family in there. But that's 209 plants out of 333. 63% of the distinct plants in the gardens are in five families. OK, 20, uh, 28 or 29 uh, of the families contain only one plant represented in the garden. OK, so this is great concentration, probably typical of herb gardens. Uh, 63 or 63% in five uh, distinct families, and then uh, 28 other families that contain only one example, the henna tree, uh, jojoba, the, the caper bush, and on and on and on. The value of that for docents is <coughs> you always need a story when a, when a, bonnet, or a guest comes in to the garden. And so they'll say, what's that? Well, tell me about it, and so forth. You can do that when you have a lot to talk about. So you have all these distinct plants in the garden, and then there's uh, you can keep yourself busy learning about them, and there's all these collections of plants and families, and you can talk about that. And the value of knowing that and actually doing a taxonomic breakdown is that one of our newer uh, docents, and she's a retired medical doctor, looked at the list and looked at the breakdown, and she said, you know, there's a half a dozen plants in the ginger family that she would have never known without a lot of work with the plant list. She said, you know, I think I'll do a talk about the medicinal uses of the ginger plant. And she gave that talk. So now people are starting to think about, they're thinking about the garden in larger units. And they're saying, all right, maybe we can think about the families. There's the coffee family. We planted a coffee tree. Well, there's a number of dye plants that are in the coffee family. And the garden is in the same family. So people are looking at the garden in, in groups, and it helps understand uh, what's really there. So that's the value overall of uh, when you put a list together, what do you have? Well, you don't know what you have until you do some summaries of the list and then figure out how to use that. So that's the value of that. Anyhow, here's the tech info source of what I just showed you in the bed. So for example, here's the note at the top of the comment called the chapter of the Florida South. There's the image I bring in. It's the same image that you saw on that, and it's done in uh, Inkscape. Um, received as a portable network graphic and then brought into uh, Tech Info. 
space and then the enumeration bits. Okay. The reason I'm showing you this version, these, for example, everything below the item is written from a script. All right, I wrote a script to write all the index entries into that because uh, I did it by hand for a while. <laughs> and it's uh, error prone and laborious and tough to maintain. So the only thing that I start with in the file is this line, which is the, and this is a single line, although it wraps in here. Most of it's taken up by the web links. But this is a single line. Forget the web links here. And that's really the data I work with these three items and up to, and that's it. And plus the, uh, the drawings. If there are a way to link the bed to a drawing where I could give it coordinates uh, in the plant description that would map that to a graphic, I would do it. But there is no way to do it right now. Okay, so you have to redo the drawing by hand. You can't just do the text editing and have it placed there. And the gardener decides to take out a plant and put five more in. So you don't know, the plant varies in length. So uh, it, it's variable. So um, that, that's part of the, the labor involved with this. But the labor uh, is a lot less because you don't have to manage all those index entries. entries. OK, so you look at this and you'll say, OK, there's four lines here for index entries for this plant. There's four lines up there. So we go botanical name, common name, or common name, botanical name. Either way, and the same thing with the family. So we have a family name and a common name for a family, if there is a common name for a family. And in this case, down here, there's only three lines because there's no common name for this family for the hops plant, the Kanabasi. And so, uh, and how I know that is uh, because I looked it up. But number one, but number two is the default is there is no common name when it goes into the script. And then I say, but let me check. And I read down through a list of family names that have common names. And if it finds that name on that list, it pulls the common name off of it. And that's how Romeoceae became the mid family, and, and vice versa here. So that's, that's, the, that's the way that happens. Uh, and so there are some other lists in here in the scripts that really contribute to this and cut the work down. So, and I, uh, I've overlooked a couple of things, and I can point those out to you. But it's a lot easier to deal with the churning around of index entries when you run it through a script. So scripts have been an amazing, efficient uh, uh, way to do this. Besides, they're fun to run, actually. And it's amazing what you can do with them. Everybody knows that, I'm sure. But um, so that's, um, that's that. And it writes it. It reads through. The tech info, the script reads through the tech info source. So that's what gets processed through the script. And these uh, index entries are written into that script and then it's saved. Okay, then the, there's one other piece, there's one other script where it takes, again, from, from the data, not from the, from the index entries, and it does the taxonomic uh, breakdown. And the way it, do it, it does it is, is, is a sort. It does a sort family first, in alphabetical order, then the genus next, and then the species next. So you have this, and then you have to, in the script, put the labels in so that tech info knows what's a section and a subsection. I'll show you that. All right, so here's the workflow, which I pretty much described for doing an update to this plant list. So you update the, you, you update the, plant, the list of plants in the diagram for each bed. And we could jump, here's what basically we could do, we could compile this and run to the end and get this. But you know, if the gardener decides she doesn't want to do this because she's told me I want to take this over. Um, but she doesn't know, she's never heard of tech info before and all that. Uh, and that's, uh, if she doesn't want to do that and they've never had an index, and they've never had the taxonomic breakdown, you know, they can get back to this and it's pretty much what they had before. <laughs> But, they, but she said, no, I want the index, no, I want the taxonomic breakdown. So she wants all the features that they've had before. But anyhow, uh, you do the diagram, you do the panelists, you do the diagrams. Very important step is to spell check. Because it ripples through the index and everything else if you don't get the words right. <laughs> okay, you run right through the script. Um, then you run the summary page script. I'll show you that when you get to the plan list. Uh, and it tells you how many distinct plants, how many plants are on the list, uh, how many plant families, and all that. 
Then you go back and there's a summary page of the garden. You revise that page, put the correct numbers in there. Go on to the run the text info source again through the indexing script. It puts the index entry, entries directly into the text info script. And when you've done that, you take um, you run the plant uh, taxonomy script against this script with the index entries in because in the taxonomy script you want to pull your index entries into it so that they're also appear in the in the final index. So they're on the plant the page for the plant index. So uh, there was a nice convenient piece of code in classical uh, shell script that uh, at which I uh, modified <laughs> and used that to sort this multi-line page, this multi-line uh, uh, set of, page, of uh, information about the scripts on the, on the page. Okay. So the next step, the gardener wants to maintain the plan list. The plan list has always been the domain of a gardener and the, and the curator. And that's why I've always said, which is correct, this list is really her list. The only thing I'm adding is formatting and fluffing. All right, I, there's nothing original in here that I've added except that shell around it. Okay, so it runs on my uh, Ubuntu system. It needs to be moved to a Microsoft Windows system. And so my question is for this group uh, is, uh, can, how easy is this going to be? And the steps for doing it, and you're, I welcome your suggestions. Uh, and it seems like I may be learning Perl. <laughs> but anyhow, if you have other ideas or suggestions, I'm happy to take that, and that's one of that. So that's that. Uh, why don't we actually, do you want to look at the plan? Do you have any questions about any of this? Good. All right, so let me bring up. Hmm. Um, there are plant list Actually, I have a suggestion. Oh, here, no, no, there we go. Plant Excel-like structure, and just uh, and just let the gardener pin that it's all in his or her computer while it's actually on the server. You, you, you know that that would be fine, and I if that's a solution. Um, the Huntington's not going to do it. Uh, now I have to go rent space on a web server and do that myself. But, but you already have a web server, don't you? But it's, a, no, no, but it's not. It's owned by the Huntington, and the Huntington staff uploads. Uh -huh. They decide what they want to upload. Uh -huh. So the, the question to the Huntington that's out there, which I haven't gotten an answer yet, is if I, uh, what about tech info? What about tech? Uh, what about uh, scripts and so forth? You know, like many organizations, I'm assuming they have a standard image for their Windows machines. And uh, I don't think, I don't know the IT group there, and I probably need to get to know them. Uh, I don't know what they're going to tolerate for images on the computers. So whether they make an exception for this and, and accept this or not, I, I really don't know yet. So, uh, and it's been all been done independently. So those are the, I, you're right. I mean, and our original thought was we do all this on a, on a web server. And we would have avoided all this. And we would write some things that would be very easy to update. You could do it. We even thought about a wiki at one point to do this. But um, that, that didn't happen. It's, and in fact, the Huntington, uh, another aside, uh, the uh, former curator in the Rose Garden put some photographs, only photographs, of the Rose Garden out on the server. The server is in Texas. And people could look at it. And that, that really wasn't a good idea for the Huntington. Well, the only thing is that if somebody, <laughs> if somebody stores on the personal computers, uh, information like list and so on, probably without proper version control backups and so on, you are going to look at some point. Well, they they're kind of they're they're a little possessive about information about their organization. I know, I, but that's you know it's their information, and that's 
And that's an area where I've been making a distinction between what volunteers do, what the Huntington staff does, and policies on either side. Joseph. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of where, and that's fine with me. We've worked very well with the PDS in distributing the way we do. Okay, so here's the plant list. That's the same thing that's going around. Um, you've, where are we here? Oh, we're almost done. Okay, so there's that. So let me go down to um, the same bed. I'm going to do two things. The same bed I showed you before uh, in that. And let's go look at the Wikipedia. You want to know something about this plant? And there we are. You can read up about the plant and put together a few facts about it that you could come in and talk to a volunteer about. Um, uh, Let's see, there's uh, Plants for a Future, and that's, that's a group in England. It's a very good website. Uh, the gardener likes it, I like it. Uh, and it has a lot of the same information, but uh, more focused on horticulture as opposed to general information. But anyhow, for any of these plants on this list, they have a choice of one or two links to a server, and of course they can, they can go anywhere they want after that. So that's... That's the benefit for the, yes, the benefit for. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm just waiting for the. <laughs> to, to, to kick me out of here. Uh, no. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> uh, all right, so. Uh, I'll moderate the Russian question. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so plant ranks, so the plant summary, and the information on here is what it comes out of one of the scripts, the summary plant list, and tells you the number of plants, uh, how many families, and the number of plants in the top four or five or six families. All right, so that's, that's that. That gets updated by hand for those numbers. The index uh, entry script is run against that and produces that. And now here's the plant ranks. And this is a taxonomic breakdown. Uh, there is only one plant, this Acer, this maple tree, in this, in this first group. So it's an alphabetical list of the families, and then the genus, and then the individual plants. And so we have the same web links associated with each plant, common name, botanical name, family name. And so this runs through all the families and so forth in the garden. So a lot of repetition of some pretty simple software. What makes Tech Info a good choice for that besides the multiple uh, outputs, which I don't use, is it's a very simple markup. And the scripts deal very well with that. Uh, there's not a lot of struggling to write a script, to write a script to do things with a tech info source, and for that I'm grateful. Uh, we had one final problem by this, is I wanted to be uh, typographically improve this, and as you probably know in the uh, Chicago Manual style, for a hybrid plant, the correct symbol to bind the two contributing plants into that hybrid is the mathematical time symbol. All right, I've been using a lowercase x. And most, many publications use a lowercase Roman X to do that. And so I thought, you know, <laughs> <laughs> So I had figured out how to do it in the tech uh, info body. And did, and so got the proper symbol in there. But I couldn't get it to show up in the index. Uh, so in frustration, I, you know, this is beyond my uh, understanding of tech info. I wrote to Carl. And Carl said, oh, I'll look at it, and sent back a tech macro, which I then, and I have to tell you, after you do all the thrashing around with the scripts, and you get a final source code that you're ready to run through tech info and the indexing and everything, you change the lowercase x to the macro name in between those, and bingo, it comes out in the index and it comes out in the top. So it's typically uh, graphically improved which I'm thankful, and, uh, and we tell everybody about things like that, and they, they're sort of hyper-bullying. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, there's, uh, you know, the Huntington has a publishing company, too, so if they question it, we're ready for it. <laughs> Do you have any questions about this?